The men forward were seen crouching here and there with fearful glances upwards at the enormous spars that whirled about over their heads. The torn canvas and the ends of broken gear streamed in the wind like wisps of hair. Through the clear sunshine, over the flashing turmoil and uproar of the seas, the ship ran blindly, disheveled and headlong, as if fleeing for her life. And on the poop we spun, we tottered about, distracted and noisy. We all spoke at once in a thin babble. We had the aspect of invalids and the gestures of maniacs. Eyes shone, large and haggard, in smiling, meager faces that seemed to have been dusted over with powdered chalk. We stamped, clapped our hands, feeling ready to jump and do anything, but in reality hardly able to keep on our feet. Captain Alistoon, hard and slim, gesticulated madly from the poop at Mr. Baker. Steady these foreyards. Steady them the best you can. On the main deck, men excited by his cries, splashed, dashing aimlessly here and there with the foam swirling up to their waists. Apart, far aft, and alone by the helm, old Singleton had deliberately tucked his white beard under the top button of his glistening coat, swaying upon the din and tumult of the seas, with the whole battered length of the ship launched forward in a rolling rush before his steady old eyes. He stood rigidly still, forgotten by all, and with an attentive face. In front of his erect figure, only the two arms moved crosswise with a swift and sudden readiness to check or urge again the rapid stir of circling spokes. He steered with care. Chapter 4 On men reprieved by its disdainful mercy, the immortal sea confers in its justice the full privilege of desired unrest. Through the perfect wisdom of its grace, they are not permitted to meditate at ease upon the complicated and acrid savor of existence. They must, without pause, justify their life to the eternal pity that commands toil to be hard and unceasing, from sunrise to sunset, from sunset to sunrise, till the weary succession of nights and days, tainted by the obstinate clamor of sages, demanding bliss and an empty heaven, is redeemed at last by the vast silence of pain and labor, by the dumb fear and the dumb courage of men obscure, forgetful, and enduring. The master and Mr. Baker, coming face to face, stared for a moment with the intense and amazed looks of men meeting unexpectedly after years of trouble. Their voices were gone, and they whispered desperately at one another, Anyone missing? asked Captain Alastoon. No, all there. Anybody hurt? Only the second mate. I will look after him directly. We're lucky. Very, articulated Mr. Baker faintly. He gripped the rail and rolled bloodshot eyes. The little gray man made an effort to raise his voice above a dull mutter and fixed his chief mate with a cold gaze, piercing like a dart. Get sail on ship, he said, speaking authoritatively and with an inflexible snap of his thin lips. Get sail on her as soon as you can. This is a fair wind. At once, sir, don't give the men time to feel themselves. They will get done up and stiff, and we will never... We must get her along now. He reeled to a long, heavy roll. The rail dipped into the glancing, hissing water. He caught a shroud, swung helplessly against the mate. Now we have a fair wind at last. Make sail. His head rolled from shoulder to shoulder. His eyelids began to beat rapidly. And the pumps, pumps, Mr. Baker. He peered as though the face within a foot of his eyes had been half a mile off. Keep the men on the move to, to get her along. He mumbled in a drowsy tone like a man going off into a doze. He pulled himself together suddenly. Mustn't stand, won't do, he said with a painful attempt at a smile. He let go his hold and, propelled by the dip of the ship, ran aft unwillingly with small steps till he brought up against the binnacle stand. Hanging on there, he looked up in an aimless manner at Singleton, who, unheeding him, watched anxiously the end of the jib boom. Steering gear works all right, he asked. 
There was a noise in the old seaman's throat as though the words had been rattling together before they could come out. Steers like a little boat, he said at last, with hoarse tenderness, without giving the master as much as half a glance. Then, watchfully, spun the wheel down, steadied, flung it back again. Captain Alastoon tore himself away from the delight of leaning against the binnacle and began to walk the poop, swaying and reeling to preserve his balance. The pump rods, clanking, stamped in short jumps, while the flywheels turned smoothly with great speed at the foot of the mainmast, flinging back and forth with a regular impetuosity two limp clusters of men clinging to the handles. They abandoned themselves, swaying from the hip with twitching faces and stony eyes. The carpenter, sounding from time to time, exclaimed mechanically, Shake her up! Keep her going! Mr. Baker could not speak, but found his voice to shout, and under the goad of his objurgations, men looked to the lashings, dragged out new sails, and thinking themselves unable to move, carried heavy blocks aloft, overhauled the gear. They went up the rigging with faltering and desperate efforts. Their heads swam as they shifted their hold, stepped blindly on the yards like men in the dark, or trusted themselves to the first rope at hand with the negligence of exhausted strength. The narrow escapes from falls did not disturb the languid beat of their hearts. The roar of the seas, seething far below them, sounded continuous and faint, like an indistinct noise from another world. The wind filled their eyes with tears, and with heavy gusts tried to push them off from where they swayed in insecure positions. With streaming faces and blowing hair, they flew up and down between sky and water, bestriding the ends of yard arms, crouching on foot ropes, embracing lips to have their hands free, or standing up against chain ties. Their thoughts floated vaguely between the desire of rest and the desire of life, while their stiffened fingers cast off head earrings, fumbled for knives, or held with tenacious grip against the violent shocks of beating canvas. They glared savagely at one another, made frantic signs with one hand while they held their life in the other, looked down on the narrow strip of flooded deck, shouted along to leeward, Light two! Haul out! Make fast! Their lips moved, their eyes started, furious and eager with the desire to be understood, but the wind tossed their words unheard upon the disturbed sea. In an unendurable and unending strain, they worked like men driven by a merciless dream to toil in an atmosphere of ice or flame. They burnt and shivered in turns. Their eyeballs smarted as if in the smoke of a conflagration. Their heads were ready to burst with every shout. Hard fingers seemed to grip their throats. At every roll they thought, Now I must let go. It will shake us all off. And thrown about aloft, they cried wildly, Look out there! Catch the end! Reeve clear! Turn this block! They nodded desperately, shook infuriated faces. No, no! From down up! They seemed to hate one another with a deadly hate. The longing to be done with it all gnawed their breasts, and the wish to do things well was a burning pain. They cursed their fate, contemned their life, and wasted their breath in deadly imprecations upon one another. The sailmaker, with his bald head bared, worked feverishly, forgetting his intimacy with so many admirals. The boatswain, climbing up with marlin spikes and bunches of spun yarn rovings, or kneeling on the yard and ready to take a turn with the midship stop, had acute and fleeting visions of his old woman and the youngsters in a moorland village. Mr. Baker, feeling very weak, tottered here and there, grunting and inflexible like a man of iron. He waylaid those who, coming from aloft, stood gasping for breath. He ordered, encouraged, scolded. Now then, to the main topsail now. Tally onto that gant line. Don't stand about there. Is there no rest for us? muttered voices. He spun round fiercely with a sinking heart. No, no rest till the work is done. Work till you drop. That's what you're here for. A bowed seaman at his elbow gave a short laugh. Do or die, he croaked bitterly, 
then spat into his broad palms, swung up his long arms, and grasping the rope high above his head, sent out a mournful, wailing cry for a pull altogether. A sea boarded the quarter-deck and sent the whole lot sprawling to leeward. Caps, handspikes, floated. Clenched hands, kicking legs, with here and there a spluttering face, stuck out of the white hiss of foaming water. Mr. Baker, knocked down with the rest, screamed, Don't let go that rope! Hold on to it! Hold! And sorely bruised by the brutal fling, they held on to it as though it had been the fortune of their life. The ship ran, rolling heavily, and the topping crests glanced past port and starboard, flashing their white heads. Pumps were freed. Braces were rove. The three topsails and foresail were set. She spurted faster over the water, outpacing the swift rush of waves. The menacing thunder of distracted seas rose behind her, filled the air with the tremendous vibrations of its voice and devastated, battered, and wounded, she drove foaming to the northward, as though inspired by the courage of a high endeavor. The forecastle was a place of damp desolation. They looked at their dwelling with dismay. It was slimy, dripping. It hummed hollow with the wind, and was strewn with shapeless wreckage like a half-tide cavern in a rocky and exposed coast. Many had lost all they had in the world, but most of the starboard watch had preserved their chests. Thin streams of water trickled out of them, however. The beds were soaked, the blankets spread out and saved by some nails squashed underfoot. They dragged wet rags from evil-smelling corners, and wringing the water out, recognized their property. Some smiled stiffly. Others looked round, blank and mute. There were cries of joy over old waistcoats and groans of sorrow over shapeless things found among the splinters of smashed bedboards. One lamp was discovered jammed under the bowsprit. Charlie whimpered a little. Knowles stumped here and there, sniffing, examining dark places for salvage. He poured dirty water out of a boot and was concerned to find the owner. Those who, overwhelmed by their losses, sat on the forepeak hatch, remained elbows on knees, and with a fist against each cheek, disdained to look up. He pushed it under their noses. Here's a good boot. Yours? They snarled. No, get out. One snapped at him. Take it to hell out of this. He seemed surprised. Why, it's a good boot. But remembering suddenly that he had lost every stitch of his clothing, he dropped his find and began to swear. In the dim light, cursing voices clashed. A man came in and, dropping his arms, stood still, repeating from the doorstep, Here's a blooming old go! Here's a blooming old go! A few rooted anxiously in flooded chests for tobacco. They breathed hard, clamored with heads down. Look at that, Jack! Here, Sam, here's my shore-going rig spoilt forever. One blasphemed tearfully, holding up a pair of dripping trousers. No one looked at him. The cat came out from somewhere. He had an ovation. They snatched him from hand to hand, caressed him in a murmur of pet names. They wondered where he had weathered it out, disputed about it. A squabbling argument began. Two men brought in a bucket of fresh water, and all crowded round it. But Tom, lean and mewing, came up with every hair astir, and had the first drink. A couple of hands went aft for oil and biscuits. Then, in the yellow light, and in the intervals of mopping the deck, they crunched hard bread, arranging to worry through somehow. Men chummed as to beds. Turns were settled for wearing boots and having the use of oilskin coats. They called one another Old Man and Sonny in cheery voices. Friendly slaps resounded. Jokes were shouted. One or two, stretched on the wet deck, slept with heads pillowed on their bent arms, and several, sitting on the hatch, smoked. Their weary faces appeared through a thin blue haze, pacified and with sparkling eyes. The bosun put his head through the door. Relieve the wheel, one of you, he shouted inside. It's six. 
Blame me if that old singleton hasn't been there more than thirty hours. You are a fine lot. He slammed the door again. Mates watch on deck, said someone. Hey, Duncan, it's your relief, shouted three or four together. He had crawled into an empty bunk and on wet planks lay still. Duncan, your wheel. He made no sound. Duncan's dead, guffawed someone. Sell his bloomin' clothes, shouted another. Duncan, if you don't go to the bloomin' wheel, they will sell your clothes, do you hear? Cheered a third. He groaned from his dark hole. He complained about pains in all his bones. He whimpered pitifully. He won't go, exclaimed a contemptuous voice. Your turn, Davis. The young seaman rose painfully, squaring his shoulders. Duncan stuck his head out, and it appeared in the yellow light fragile and ghastly. I will give you a pound of tobacco, he whined in a conciliating voice, as soon as I draw it from aft. I will, help me. Davis swung his arm backhanded, and the head vanished. I'll go, he said, but you will pay for it. He walked unsteady but resolute to the door. So I will, yelped Duncan, popping out behind him. So I will, so help me. A pound, three bob they charge. Davis flung the door open. You will pay my price in fine weather, he shouted over his shoulder. One of the men unbuttoned his wet coat rapidly, threw it at his head. Here, Taffy, take that, you thief. Thank you, he cried from the darkness above the swish of rolling water. He could be heard splashing. A sea came on board with a thump. He's got his bath already, remarked a grim shellback. Aye, aye, grunted others. Then after a long silence, Wamibo made strange noises. Hello, what's up with you? said someone grumpily. He says he would have gone for Davy, explained Archie, who was the Finn's interpreter generally. I believe him, cried voices. Never mind, Dutchy, you'll do, muddlehead. Your turn will come soon enough. You don't know when you're well off. They ceased and all together turned their faces to the door. Singleton stepped in, advanced two paces, and stood, swaying slightly. The sea hissed, flowed, roaring past the bows, and the forecastle trembled, full of deep murmurs. The lamp flared, swinging like a pendulum. He looked with a dreamy and puzzled stare, as though he could not distinguish the still men from their restless shadows. There were awestruck exclamations. Hallo! Hallo! How does it look outside now, Singleton? Those who sat on the hatch lifted their eyes in silence, and the next oldest seaman in the ship, those two understood one another, though they hardly exchanged three words in a day, gazed up at his friend attentively for a moment, then, taking a short clay pipe out of his mouth, offered it without a word. Singleton put out his arm towards it, missed, staggered, and suddenly fell forward, crashing down, stiff and headlong, like an uprooted tree. There was a swift rush. Men pushed, crying, He's done! Turn him over! Stand clear there! Under a crowd of startled faces, bending over him, he lay on his back, staring upwards in a continuous and intolerable manner. In the breathless silence of a general consternation, he said in a grating murmur, I'm all right, and clutched with his hands. They helped him up. He mumbled despondently. I'm getting old, old. Not you, cried Belfast with ready tact. Supported on all sides, he hung his head. Are you better? they asked. He glared at them from under his eyebrows with large black eyes spreading over his chest the bushy whiteness of a beard long and thick. Old. Old, he repeated sternly. Helped along, he reached his bunk. There was in it a slimy, soft heap of something that smelt, as does at dead low water, a muddy foreshore. It was his soaked straw bed. With a convulsive effort, he pitched himself on it, and in the darkness of the narrow place could be heard growling angrily, like an irritated and savage animal uneasy in its den. Bit of breeze. Small thing. Can't stand up. Old. He slept at last, high-booted, sou'wester on head, and his oilskin clothes rustled. 
when with a deep, sighing groan he turned over. Men conversed about him in quiet, concerned whispers. This will break him up. Strong as a horse. Aye, but he ain't what he used to be. In sad murmurs they gave him up. Yet at midnight he turned out to duty as if nothing had been the matter, and answered to his name with a mournful, Here. He brooded alone more than ever, in an impenetrable silence and with a saddened face. For many years he had heard himself called Old Singleton, and had serenely accepted the qualification, taking it as a tribute of respect due to a man who, through half a century, had measured his strength against the favors and the rages of the sea. He had never given a thought to his mortal self. He lived unscathed, as though he had been indestructible, surrendering to all the temptations, weathering many gales. He had panted in sunshine, shivered in the cold, suffered hunger, thirst, debauch, passed through many trials, known all the furies, old. It seemed to him he was broken at last, and like a man bound treacherously while he sleeps, he woke up fettered by the long chain of disregarded years. He had to take up at once the burden of all his existence, and found it almost too heavy for his strength. Old. He moved his arms, shook his head, felt his limbs. Getting old. And then? He looked upon the immortal sea with the awakened and groping perception of its heartless might. He saw it unchanged, black and foaming under the eternal scrutiny of the stars. He heard its impatient voice calling for him out of a pitiless vastness full of unrest, of turmoil, and of terror. He looked afar upon it, and he saw an immensity tormented and blind, moaning and furious, that claimed all the days of his tenacious life, and when life was over, would claim the worn-out body of its slave. This was the last of the breeze. It veered quickly, changed to a black southeaster, and blew itself out, giving the ship a famous shove to the northward into the joyous sunshine of the trade. Rapid and white, she ran homewards in a straight path, under a blue sky, and upon the plain of a blue sea. She carried Singleton's completed wisdom, Duncan's delicate susceptibilities, and the conceited folly of us all. The hours of ineffective turmoil were forgotten. The fear and anguish of these dark moments were never mentioned in the glowing peace of fine days. Yet from that time, our life seemed to start afresh, as though we had died and had been resuscitated. All the first part of the voyage, the Indian Ocean on the other side of the Cape, all that was lost in a haze, like an ineradicable suspicion of some previous existence. It had ended. Then there were blank hours, a livid blur, and again we lived. Singleton was possessed of sinister truth, Mr. Creighton of a damaged leg, the cook of fame, and shamefully abused the opportunities of his distinction. Donkin had an added grievance. He went about repeating with insistence, He said he would brain me, did you hear? They are going to murder us now for the least little thing. We began at last to think it was rather awful, and we were conceited. We boasted of our pluck, of our capacity for work, of our energy, we remembered honorable episodes, our devotion, our indomitable perseverance, and were proud of them, as though they had been the outcome of our unaided impulses. We remembered our danger, our toil, and conveniently forgot our horrible scare. We decried our officers, who had done nothing, and listened to the fascinating Duncan. His care for our rights, his disinterested concern for our dignity, were not discouraged by the invariable contumely of our words, by the disdain of our looks. Our contempt for him was unbounded, and we could not but listen with interest to that consummate artist. He told us we were good men, a blooming condemned lot of good men. Who thanked us? Who took any notice of our wrongs? Didn't we lead a dog's life for two pound ten a month? 
Did we think that miserable pay enough to compensate us for the risk to our lives and for the loss of our clothes? We've lost every rag, he cried. He made us forget that he, at any rate, had lost nothing of his own. The younger men listened, thinking, this here Duncan's a long-headed chap, though no kind of man anyhow. The Scandinavians were frightened at his audacities. Wamibo did not understand, and the older seamen thoughtfully nodded their heads, making the thin gold earrings glitter in the fleshy lobes of hairy ears. Severe, sunburnt faces were propped meditatively on tattooed forearms. Veined, brown fists held in their knotted grip the dirty white clay of smoldering pipes. They listened, impenetrable, broad-backed, with bent shoulders and in grim silence. He talked with ardor, despised and irrefutable. His picturesque and filthy loquacity flowed like a troubled stream from a poisoned source. His beady little eyes danced, glancing right and left, ever on the watch for the approach of an officer. Sometimes Mr. Baker, going forward to take a look at the head sheets, would roll with his uncouth gait through the sudden stillness of the men, or Mr. Creighton limped along, smooth-faced, youthful, and more stern than ever, piercing our short silence with a keen glance of his clear eyes. Behind his back, Duncan would begin again, darting stealthy, sidelong looks. Here's one of them. Some of yours made him fast that day. Much thanks you got for it. Ain't he a-driving you worse than ever? Let him slip overboard. Why not? It would have been less trouble. Why not? He advanced confidentially, backed away with great effect. He whispered, he screamed, waved his miserable arms no thicker than pipe stems, stretched his lean neck, spluttered, squinted. In the pauses of his impassioned orations, the wind sighed quietly aloft, the calm sea unheeded murmured in a warning whisper along the ship's side. We abominated the creature and could not deny the luminous truth of his contentions. It was all so obvious. We were indubitably good men. Our deserts were great and our pay small. Through our exertions we had saved the ship, and the skipper would get the credit of it. What had he done, we wanted to know. Duncan asked, what he could do without us. And we could not answer. We were oppressed by the injustice of the world, surprised to perceive how long we had lived under its burden without realizing our unfortunate state annoyed by the uneasy suspicion of our undiscerning stupidity. Duncan assured us it was all our good-heartedness, but we would not be consoled by such shallow sophistry. We were men enough to courageously admit to ourselves our intellectual shortcomings, though from that time we refrained from kicking him, tweaking his nose, or from accidentally knocking him about, which last, after we had weathered the cape, had been rather a popular amusement. Davis ceased to talk at him provokingly about black eyes and flattened noses. Charlie, much subdued since the gale, did not jeer at him. Knowles, deferentially and with a crafty air, propounded questions such as, Could we all have the same grub as the mates? Could we all stop ashore till we got it? What would be the next thing to try for if we got that? He answered readily with contemptuous certitude. He strutted with assurance in clothes that were much too big for him, as though he had tried to disguise himself. These were Jimmy's clothes, mostly, though he would accept anything from anybody. But nobody except Jimmy had anything to spare. His devotion to Jimmy was unbounded. He was forever dodging in the little cabin, ministering to Jimmy's wants, humoring his whims, submitting to his exacting peevishness, often laughing with him. Nothing could keep him away from the pious work of visiting the sick, especially when there was some heavy hauling to be done on deck. Mr. Baker had on two occasions jerked him out from there by the scruff of the neck to our inexpressible scandal. Was a sick chap to be left without attendance? Were we to be ill-used for attending a shipmate? What? growled Mr. Baker, turning menacingly at the mutter. And the whole half-circle, like one man, stepped back a pace. Set the topmast stunsel. 
Away aloft, Duncan, overhaul the gear, ordered the mate inflexibly. Fetch the sail along, bend the downhaul clear, bear a hand. Then the sail set, he would go slowly aft and stand looking at the compass for a long time, careworn, pensive, and breathing hard, as if stifled by the taint of unaccountable ill will that pervaded the ship. What's up amongst them, he thought. Can't make out this hanging back and growling. A good crowd, too, as they go nowadays. On deck, the men exchanged bitter words, suggested by a silly exasperation against something unjust and irremediable that would not be denied, and would whisper into their ears long after Duncan had ceased speaking. Our little world went on its curved and unswerving path, carrying a discontented and aspiring population. They found comfort of a gloomy kind in an interminable and conscientious analysis of their unappreciated worth. And, inspired by Duncan's hopeful doctrines, they dreamed enthusiastically of the time when every lonely ship would travel over a serene sea manned by a wealthy and well-fed crew of satisfied skippers. It looked as if it would be a long passage. The southeast trades, light and unsteady, were left behind. And then, on the equator and under a low gray sky, the ship in close heat, floated upon a smooth sea that resembled a sheet of ground glass. Thunder squalls hung on the horizon, circled round the ship, far off and growling angrily, like a troop of wild beasts afraid to charge home. The invisible sun, sweeping above the upright masts, made on the cloud a blurred stain of rayless light, and a similar patch of faded radiance kept pace with it from east to west over the unglittering level of the waters. At night, through the impenetrable darkness of earth and heaven, broad sheets of flame waved noiselessly, and for half a second the becalmed craft stood out with its masts and rigging, with every sail and every rope distinct and black in the center of a fiery outburst, like a charred ship enclosed in a globe of fire. And again, for long hours, she remained lost in a vast universe of night and silence, where gentle sighs, wandering here and there like forlorn souls, made the still sails flutter as in sudden fear, and the ripple of a beshrouded ocean whisper its compassion afar, in a voice mournful, immense, and faint. When the lamp was put out, and through the door thrown wide open, Jimmy, turning on his pillow, could see vanishing beyond the straight line of topgallant rail the quick repeated visions of a fabulous world made up of leaping fire and sleeping water. The lightning gleamed in his big sad eyes that seemed in a red flicker to burn themselves out in his black face, and then he would lie blinded and invisible in the midst of an intense darkness. He could hear on the quiet deck soft footfalls, the breathing of some man lounging on the doorstep, the low creak of swaying masts, or the calm voice of the watch officer reverberating aloft hard and loud amongst the unstirring sails. He listened with avidity, taking a rest in the attentive perception of the slightest sound from the fatiguing wanderings of his sleeplessness. He was cheered by the rattling of blocks, reassured by the stir and murmur of the watch, soothed by the slow yawn of some sleepy and weary seaman settling himself deliberately for a snooze on the planks. Life seemed an indestructible thing. It went on in darkness, in sunshine, in sleep. Tireless, it hovered affectionately round the imposture of his ready death. It was bright, like the twisted flare of lightning, and more full of surprises than the dark night. It made him safe, and the calm of its overpowering darkness was as precious as its restless and dangerous light. But in the evening, in the dog watches, and even far into the first night watch, a knot of men could always be seen congregated before Jimmy's cabin. They leaned on each side of the door, peacefully interested and with crossed legs. They stood astride the doorstep, discoursing, or sat in silent couples on his sea chest, while against the bulwark, along the spare topmast, 
Three or four in a row stared meditatively, with their simple faces lit up by the projected glare of Jimmy's lamp. The little place, repainted white, had in the night the brilliance of a silver shrine, where a black idol, reclining stiffly under a blanket, blinked its weary eyes and received our homage. Duncan officiated. He had the air of a demonstrator showing a phenomenon, a manifestation bizarre, simple, and meritorious, that to the beholders should be a profound and an everlasting lesson. Just look at him. He knows what's what. Never fear, he exclaimed now and then, flourishing a hand hard and fleshless like the claw of a snipe. Jimmy, on his back, smiled with reserve and without moving a limb. He affected the languor of extreme weakness so as to make it manifest to us that our delay in hauling him out from his horrible confinement, and then that night spent on the poop among our selfish neglect of his needs, had done for him. He rather liked to talk about it, and of course we were always interested. He spoke spasmodically, in fast rushes with long pauses between, as a tipsy man walks. Cook had just given me a pannikin of hot coffee. Slapped it down there on my chest. Banged the door to. I felt a heavy roll coming. Tried to save my coffee, burnt my fingers and fell out of my bunk. She went over so quick. Water came in through the ventilator. I couldn't move the door, dark as a grave. Tried to scramble up into the upper berth. Rats! A rat bit my finger as I got up. I could hear him swimming below me. I thought you would never come. I thought you were all gone overboard. Of course. Could hear nothing but the wind. Then you came, to look for the corpse, I suppose. A little more, and... Man, but you make a rare lot of noise in here, observed Archie thoughtfully. You chaps kicked up such a confounded row above, enough to scare anyone. I didn't know what you were up to, bashing the blamed planks. My head! Just what a silly, scary gang of fools would do. Not much good to me, anyhow. Just as well. Drown. Pah! He groaned, snapped his big white teeth, and gazed with scorn. Belfast lifted a pair of dolorous eyes with a broken-hearted smile, clenched his fists stealthily. Blue-eyed Archie caressed his red whiskers with a hesitating hand. The bosun at the door stared a moment and brusquely went away with a loud guffaw. Wamibo dreamed. Duncan felt all over his sterile chin for the few rare hairs and said triumphantly, with a sidelong glance at Jimmy, Look at him. Wish I was off as healthy as he is, I do. He jerked a short thumb over his shoulder towards the after end of the ship. That's the bloomin' way to do him, he yelped with forced heartiness. Jimmy said, Don't be a damn fool, in a pleasant voice. Knowles, rubbing his shoulder against the doorpost, remarked shrewdly, We can't all go and be took sick. It would be mutiny. Mutiny gone, jeered Duncan. There's no blooming law against being sick. There's six weeks hard for refusing duty, argued Knowles. I mind I once seed in Cardiff the crew of an overloaded ship. Leastways, she weren't overloaded. Only a fatherly old gentleman with a white beard and an umbrella came along the quay and talked to the ants. Said as how it was cruel hard to be drowned in winter just for the sake of a few pounds more for the owner, he said. Nearly cried over them, he did. And he had a square mainsail coat and a gaff topsail hat, too, all proper. So they chaps, they said they wouldn't go to be drowned in winter, depending upon that dear plims old man to see him through the court. They thought to have a blooming lark in two or three days spree. And the beak give them six weeks, cause the ship weren't overloaded. Anyways, they made it out in court that she wasn't. There wasn't one overloaded ship in Penarf Dark at all. Piers that old coon, he was only on pay and allowance from some kind of people under orders to look for overloaded ships. And he couldn't see no further than the length of his umbrella. Some of us in the boarding house, where I live when I'm looking for a ship in Cardiff, stood by to duck that old weeping sponger in the dock. 
We kept a good lookout, too. But he topped his boom directly he was outside the court. Yes, they got six weeks hard. They listened full of curiosity, nodding in the pauses, their rough, pensive faces. Duncan opened his mouth once or twice, but restrained himself. Jimmy lay still with open eyes and not at all interested. A seaman emitted the opinion that after a verdict of atrocious partiality, the bloomin' beaks go and drink at the skipper's expense. Others assented. It was clear, of course. Duncan said, Well, six weeks ain't much trouble. You sleep all night in regular and choky. Do it on my head. You are used to it, ain't you, Duncan? asked somebody. Jimmy condescended to laugh. It cheered up everyone wonderfully. Knowles, with surprising mental agility, shifted his ground. If we all went sick, what would become of the ship, eh? He posed the problem and grinned all round. Let her go to L, jeered Duncan. Damn her, she ain't yawn. What? Just let her drift? insisted Knowles in a tone of unbelief. Aye, drift and be blowed, affirmed Duncan with fine recklessness. The others did not see it, meditated. The stores would run out, he muttered, and never get anywhere. And what about payday? he added with greater assurance. Jack locks a good payday, exclaimed a listener on the doorstep. Aye, because then the girls put one arm round his neck and t'other in his pocket and call him Ducky, don't they, Jack? Jack, you're a terror with the gals. He takes three of them in tow to once, <laughs> like one of them Watkins's two funnel tugs waddling away with three schooners behind. Jack, you're a lame scamp. Jack, tell us about that one with a blue eye and a black eye. Do? There's plenty of girls with one black eye along the highway by... No, that's a special one. Come, Jack. Duncan looked severe and disgusted. Jimmy very bored. A grey-haired sea dog shook his head slightly, smiling at the bowl of his pipe, discreetly amused. Knowles turned about bewildered, stammered first at one, then at the other. No, I never... Can't talk sensible sense midst you. Always on the kid. He retired bashfully, muttering and pleased. They laughed, hooting in the crude light around Jimmy's bed, where on a white pillow his hollowed black face moved to and fro restlessly. A puff of wind came, made the flame of the lamp leap, and outside, high up, the sails fluttered, while nearby the block of the foresheet struck a ringing blow on the iron bulwark. A voice far off cried, Helm up! Another more faint answered, Hard up, sir! They became silent, waited expectantly. The grey-haired seaman knocked his pipe on the doorstep and stood up. The ship leaned over gently, and the sea seemed to wake up, murmuring drowsily. Here's a little wind coming, said someone very low. Jimmy turned over slowly to face the breeze. The voice in the night cried out and commanding, Haul the spanker out! The group before the door vanished out of the light. They could be heard tramping aft while they repeated with varied intonations, Spanker out! Out spanker, sir! Duncan remained alone with Jimmy. There was a silence. Jimmy opened and shut his lips several times as if swallowing drafts of fresher air. Duncan moved the toes of his bare feet and looked at them thoughtfully. Ain't you going to give them a hand with the sail? asked Jimmy. No. If six of them ain't enough beef to set that blamed rotten spanker, they ain't fit to live, answered Duncan in a bored, faraway voice, as though he had been talking from the bottom of a hole. Jimmy considered the conical, fowl-like profile with a queer kind of interest. He was leaning out of his bunk with the calculating, uncertain expression of a man who reflects how best to lay hold of some strange creature that looks as though it could sting or bite. But he said only, The mate will miss you, and there will be ructions. Duncan got up to go. I will do for him some dark night. See if I don't, he said over his shoulder. Jimmy went on quickly. You are like a Paul Parrot, like a screeching Paul Parrot. Duncan stopped and cocked his head attentively on one side. 
His big ears stood out transparent and veined, resembling the thin wings of a bat. Yes, he said with his back towards Jimmy. Yes, chatter out all you know, like, like a dirty white cockatoo. Duncan waited. He could hear the others breathing, long and slow, the breathing of a man with a hundredweight or so on the breastbone. Then he asked calmly, What do I know? What? What I tell you? Not much. What do you want to talk about my health so? It's a blooming imposition, a blooming stinking first-class imposition. But it don't take me in, not it. Jimmy kept still. Duncan put his hands in his pockets, and in one slouching stride came up to the bunk. I talk. What's the odds? They ain't men here. Sheep they are. A driven mutt of sheep. I hold you up. Why not? You're well off. I am. I don't say anything about that. Well, let him see it. Let him learn what a man can do. I am a man. I know all about you. Jimmy threw himself further away on the pillow. The other stretched out his skinny neck, jerked his bird face down at him as though pecking at the eyes. I am a man. I've seen the inside of every chokey in the colonies rather than give up my rights. You are a jail prop, said Jimmy weakly. I am, and proud of it, too. You, you haven't the blooming nerve, so you invented this here dodge. He paused then with marked afterthought accentuated slowly, "'Yer ain't sick, are yer?' "'No,' said Jimmy firmly. "'Been out of sorts now and again this year,' he mumbled with a sudden drop in his voice. Duncan closed one eye, amicable and confidential. He whispered, "'Ye have done this afore, haven't ye?' Jimmy smiled. Then, as if unable to hold back, he let himself go. Last ship, yes. I was out of sorts on the passage, see? It was easy. They paid me off in Calcutta, and the skipper made no bones about it either. I got my money all right, laid up fifty-eight days. The fools, oh Lord, the fools, paid right off. He laughed spasmodically. Duncan chimed in, giggling. Then Jimmy coughed violently. I am as well as ever, he said as soon as he could draw a breath. Duncan made a derisive gesture. In course, he said profoundly, anyone can see that. They don't, said Jimmy, gasping like a fish. They would swallow any yarn, affirmed Duncan. Don't you let on too much, admonished Jimmy in an exhausted voice. Your little game, eh? commented Duncan jovially. Then with sudden disgust, you're all for yourself so long as you're right. So charged with egoism, James Waite pulled the blanket up to his chin and lay still for a while. His heavy lips protruded in an everlasting black pout. Why are you so hot on making trouble? He asked without much interest. Cause it's a blooming shime. We are put upon. Bad food, bad pay. I want us to kick up a blooming row, a blamed owlin' row that would make them remember. Knocking people about. Brain us. Indeed. Ain't we men? His altruistic indignation blazed. Then he said calmly, I've been airing your clothes. All right, said Jimmy languidly. Bring them in. Give us the key of your chest. I've put them away for you, said Duncan with friendly eagerness. Bring them in. I will put them away myself, answered James Waite with severity. Duncan looked down, muttering. What do you say? What do you say? inquired Waite anxiously. Nothing. The night's dry. Let him hang out till the morning said Duncan in a strangely trembling voice, as though restraining laughter or rage. Jimmy seemed satisfied. Give me a little water for the night in my mug there, he said. Duncan took a stride over the doorstep. Get it yourself, he replied in a surly tone. You can do it, unless you are sick. Of course I can do it, said Waite. Only... Well, then do it, said Duncan viciously. If you can look after your clothes, you can look after yourself. He went on deck without a look back. Jimmy reached out for the mug, not a drop. He put it back gently with a faint sigh 
and closed his eyes. He thought, that lunatic Belfast will bring me some water if I ask. Fool, I am very thirsty. It was very hot in the cabin, and it seemed to turn slowly round, detach itself from the ship and swing out smoothly into a luminous, arid space where a black sun shone, spinning very fast. A place without any water, no water. A policeman with the face of Donkin drank a glass of beer by the side of an empty well and flew away flapping vigorously. A ship whose mastheads protruded through the sky and could not be seen was discharging grain, and the wind whirled the dry husks in spirals along the key of a dock with no water in it. He whirled along with the husks very tired and light. All his inside was gone. He felt lighter than the husks and more dry. He expanded his hollow chest. The air streamed in, carrying away in its rush a lot of strange things that resembled houses, trees, people, lampposts. No more! There was no more air, and he had not finished drawing his long breath. But he was in jail. They were locking him up. A door slammed. They turned the key twice, flung a bucket of water over him. Phew! What for? He opened his eyes thinking the fall had been very heavy for an empty man. Empty, empty. He was in his cabin. Ah, all right. His face was streaming with perspiration, his arms heavier than lead. He saw the cook standing in the doorway, a brass key in one hand and a bright tin hook pot in the other. I have locked up the galley for the night, said the cook, beaming benevolently. Eight bells are just gone. I brought you a pot of cold tea for your night's drinking, Jimmy. I sweetened it with some white cabin sugar, too. Well, it won't break the ship. He came in, hung the pot on the edge of the bunk, asked perfunctorily, How goes it? and sat down on the box. Hmm, grunted Waite inhospitably. The cook wiped his face with a dirty cotton rag, which afterwards he tied round his neck. That's how them firemen do in steamboats, he said serenely and much pleased with himself. My work is as heavy as theirs, I'm thinking, and longer hours. Did you ever see them down the stokehold? Like fiends they look, firing, firing, firing down there. He pointed his forefinger at the deck. Some gloomy thought darkened his shining face, fleeting, like the shadow of a traveling cloud over the light of a peaceful sea. The relieved watch tramped noisily forward, passing in a body across the sheen of the doorway. Someone cried, Good night! Belfast stopped for a moment and looked at Jimmy, quivering and speechless with repressed emotion. He gave the cook a glance charged with dismal foreboding and vanished. The cook cleared his throat. Jimmy stared upwards and kept as still as a man in hiding. The night was clear with a gentle breeze. Above the mastheads, the resplendent curve of the Milky Way spanned the sky like a triumphal arch of eternal light thrown over the dark pathway of the earth. On the forecastle head, a man whistled with loud precision a lively jig, while another could be heard faintly, shuffling and stamping in time. There came from forward a confused murmur of voices, laughter, snatches of song, the cook shook his head, glanced obliquely at Jimmy, and began to mutter, I dance and sing, that's all they think of. I am surprised that Providence don't get tired. They forget the day that's sure to come. But you... Jimmy drank a gulp of tea hurriedly as though he had stolen it, and shrank under his blanket, edging away towards the bulkhead. The cook got up, closed the door, then sat down again and said distinctly, Whenever I poke my galley fire, I think of you chaps, swearing, stealing, lying, and worse, as if there was no such thing as another world. Not bad fellows either, in a way, he conceded slowly. Then after a pause of regretful musing, he went on in a resigned tone, Well, well, they will have a hot time of it. Hot, did I say? The furnaces of one of them white star boats ain't nothing to it. He kept very quiet for a while. There was a great stir in his brain, 
an addled vision of bright outlines, an exciting row of rousing songs and groans of pain. He suffered, enjoyed, admired, approved. He was delighted, frightened, exalted, as on that evening, the only time in his life twenty-seven years ago, he loved to recall the number of years, when as a young man he had, through keeping bad company, become intoxicated in an East End music hall. A tide of sudden feeling swept him clean out of his body. He soared. He contemplated the secret of the hereafter. It commended itself to him. It was excellent. He loved it himself, all hands, and Jimmy. His heart overflowed with tenderness, with comprehension, with the desire to meddle, with anxiety for the soul of that black man, with the pride of possessed eternity, with the feeling of might. Snatch him up in his arms and pitch him right into the middle of salvation. The black soul, blacker body, rot, devil. No. Talk. Strength. Samson. There was a great din as of cymbals in his ears. He flashed through an ecstatic jumble of shining faces, lilies, prayer books, unearthly joy, white skirts, gold harps, black coats, wings. He saw flowing garments, clean-shaved faces, a sea of light, a lake of pitch. There were sweet scents, a smell of sulfur, red tongues of flame licking a white mist. An awesome voice thundered. It lasted three seconds. Jimmy, he cried in an inspired tone. Then he hesitated. A spark of human pity glimmered yet through the infernal fog of his supreme conceit. What? said James Waite unwillingly. There was a silence. He turned his head just the least bit and stole a cautious glance. The cook's lips moved without a sound. His face was rapt, his eyes turned up. He seemed to be mentally imploring deck beams, the brass hook of the lamp, two cockroaches. Look here, said Waite. I want to go to sleep. I think I could. This is no time for sleep, exclaimed the cook very loud. He had prayerfully divested himself of the last vestige of his humanity. He was a voice, a fleshless and sublime thing, as on that memorable night the night when he went walking over the sea to make coffee for perishing sinners. This is no time for sleeping, he repeated with exultation. I can't sleep. Don't care, damn, said Waite with factitious energy. I can go and turn in. Swear? In the very jaws? In the very jaws? Don't you see the everlasting fire? Don't you feel it? Blind, chock full of sin. Repent. Repent. I can't bear to think of you. I hear the call to save you, night and day. Jimmy, let me save you. The words of entreaty and menace broke out of him in a roaring torrent. The cockroaches ran away. Jimmy perspired, wriggling stealthily under his blanket. The cook yelled, Your days are numbered. Get out of this, boomed Wait courageously. Pray with me. I won't. The little cabin was as hot as an oven. It contained an immensity of fear and pain, an atmosphere of shrieks and moans, prayers vociferated like blasphemies and whispered curses. Outside, the men called by Charlie, who informed them in tones of delight that there was a holy row going on in Jimmy's place, crowded before the closed door, too startled to open it. All hands were there. The watch below had jumped out on deck in their shirts, as after a collision, men running up asked, What is it? Others said, Listen. The muffled screaming went on. On your knees! On your knees! Shut up! Never! You are delivered into my hands. Your life has been saved. Purpose! Mercy! Repent! You are a crazy fool! Account of you! You! Never sleep in this world if I... Leave off! No! Stokehold! Only think... Then an impassioned, screeching babble where words pattered like hail. No, shouted Wait. Yes, you are. No help. Everybody says so. You lie. I see you dying this minute before my eyes, as good as dead already. Help, shouted Jimmy piercingly. Not in this valley. 
Look upwards, howled the other. Go away! Murder! Help! clamored Jimmy. His voice broke. There were moanings, low mutters, a few sobs. What's the matter now? said a seldom heard voice. Fall back, men! Fall back there! repeated Mr. Creighton, sternly pushing through. Here's the old man, whispered some. The cook's in there, sir, exclaimed several, backing away. The door clattered open. A broad stream of light darted out on wondering faces. A warm whiff of vitiated air passed. The two mates towered head and shoulders above the spare, gray-haired man who stood revealed between them in shabby clothes, stiff and angular, like a small carved figure and with a thin, composed face. The cook got up from his knees. Jimmy sat high in the bunk, clasping his drawn-up legs. The tassel of the blue nightcap almost imperceptibly trembled over his knees. They gazed astonished at his long, curved back, while the white corner of one eye gleamed blindly at them. He was afraid to turn his head. He shrank within himself, and there was an aspect astounding and animal-like in the perfection of his expectant immobility, a thing of instinct the unthinking stillness of a scared brute. "'What are you doing here?' asked Mr. Baker sharply. "'My duty,' said the cook with ardor. "'Your what?' began the mate. Captain Allistoon touched his arm lightly. "'I know his caper,' he said in a low voice. "'Come out of that, Podmore,' he ordered aloud. The cook wrung his hands, shook his fists above his head, and his arms dropped as if too heavy. For a moment he stood distracted and speechless. Never, he stammered. I, he, I. What do you say? pronounced Captain Alastoon. Come out at once, or I am going, said the cook with a hasty and somber resignation. He strode over the doorstep firmly, hesitated, made a few steps. They looked at him in silence. I make you responsible, he cried, desperately turning half round. That man is dying. I make you. You there yet? called the master in a threatening tone. No, sir, he exclaimed hurriedly in a startled voice. The bosun led him away by the arm. Someone laughed. Jimmy lifted his head for a stealthy glance and in one unexpected leap sprang out of his bunk. Mr. Baker made a clever catch and felt him very limp in his arms. The group at the door grunted with surprise. He lies, gasped Waite. He talked about black devils. He is a devil, a white devil. I am all right. He stiffened himself, and Mr. Baker experimentally let him go. He staggered a pace or two. Captain Allistoon watched him with a quiet and penetrating gaze. Belfast ran to his support. He did not appear to be aware of anyone near him. He stood silent for a moment, battling single-handed with a legion of nameless terrors amidst the eager looks of excited men who watched him far off, utterly alone in the impenetrable solitude of his fear. The sea gurgled through the scuppers as the ship heeled over to a short puff of wind. "'Keep him away from me!' said James Waite at last in his fine baritone voice and leaning with all his weight on Belfast's neck. I've been better this last week. I am well. I was going back to duty. Tomorrow. Now, if you like, Captain. Belfast hitched his shoulders to keep him upright. No, said the master, looking at him fixedly. Under Jimmy's armpit, Belfast's red face moved uneasily. A row of eyes, gleaming, stared on the edge of light. They pushed one another with elbows, turned their heads, whispered. Wait, let his chin fall on his breast, and with lowered eyelids looked round in a suspicious manner. Why not? cried a voice from the shadows. The man's all right, sir. I am all right, said Wait with eagerness. Ben sick? Better. Turn to now. He sighed. Holy mother! exclaimed Belfast with a heave of the shoulders. Stand up, Jimmy! Keep away from me, then, said Wait, giving Belfast a petulant push, and reeling, fetched against the doorpost. His cheekbones glistened as though they had been varnished. He snatched off his nightcap, wiped his perspiring face with it, flung it on the deck. I am coming out, he declared without stirring. No, you don't, said the master curtly. Bare feet shuffled. Disapproving voices murmured all round. He went on as if he had not heard. You have been skulking nearly all the passage, and now you want to come out. You think you are near enough to the pay table now. 
Smell the shore, eh? I I've been sick, now better, mumbled Wait, glaring in the light. You have been shamming sick, retorted Captain Alastoon with severity. Why, he hesitated for less than half a second, why, anybody can see that. There's nothing the matter with you, but you choose to lie up to please yourself, and now you shall lie up to please me. Mr. Baker, my orders are that this man is not to be allowed on deck to the end of the passage. There were exclamations of surprise, triumph, indignation. The dark group of men swung across the light. What for? Told you so. Bloomin' shame. We've got to say something about that, screeched Duncan from the rear. Never mind, Jim, we will see you righted, cried several together. An elderly seaman stepped to the front. Do you mean to say, sir, he asked ominously, that a sick chap ain't allowed to get well in this here hooker? Behind him, Duncan whispered excitedly amongst a staring crowd where no one spared him a glance. But Captain Alastoon shook a forefinger at the angry, bronzed face of the speaker. You... you hold your tongue, he said warningly. This isn't the way, clamored two or three younger men. Are we blowing machines? inquired Duncan in a piercing tone and dived under the elbows of the front rank. Soon show him we ain't boys. The man's a man if he is black. We ain't going to work this bloomin' ship short-handed if Snowball's all right. He says he is. Well then, strike, boys, strike. That's the bloomin' ticket. Captain Alastoon said sharply to the second mate, Keep quiet, Mr. Creighton, and stood composed in the tumult, listening with profound attention to mixed growls and screeches, to every exclamation and every curse of the sudden outbreak. Somebody slammed the cabin door to with a kick. The darkness, full of menacing mutters, leaped with a short clatter over the streak of light, and the men became gesticulating shadows that growled, hissed, laughed excitedly. Mr. Baker whispered, Get away from them, sir. The big shape of Mr. Creighton hovered silently about the slight figure of the master. We have been imposed upon all this voyage, said a gruff voice, but this here fancy takes the cake. That man is a shipmate. Are we bloomin' kids? The port watch will refuse duty. Charlie, carried away by his feelings, whistled shrilly, then yelped, Give us our Jimmy! This seemed to cause a variation in the disturbance. There was a fresh burst of squabbling uproar. A lot of quarrels were set going at once. Yes, no, never been sick. Go for them to once. Shut your mouth, youngster, this is men's work. Is it? muttered Captain Alastoon bitterly. Mr. Baker grunted, Oh, they've gone silly. They've been simmering for the last month. I did notice, said the master. They have started a row amongst themselves now, said Mr. Creighton, with disdain. Better get aft, sir. We will soothe them. Keep your temper, Creighton, said the master. And the three men began to move slowly towards the cabin door. In the shadows of the fore rigging, a dark mass stamped, eddied, advanced, retreated. There were words of reproach, encouragement, unbelief, execration. The elder seamen, bewildered and angry, growled their determination to go through with something or other, but the younger school of advanced thought exposed their and Jimmy's wrongs with confused shouts, arguing amongst themselves. They clustered round that moribund carcass, the fit emblem of their aspirations, and encouraging one another, they swayed, they tramped on one spot, shouting that they would not be put upon. Inside the cabin, Belfast, helping Jimmy into his bunk, twitched all over in his desire not to miss all the row, and with difficulty restrained the tears of his facile emotion. James Waite, flat on his back under the blanket, gasped complaints. We will back you up, never fear, assured Belfast, busy about his feet. I'll come out tomorrow morning, take my chance. You fellows must, mumbled Wait. I come out tomorrow, skipper or no skipper. He lifted one arm with great difficulty, passed the hand over his face. Don't you let that cook, he breathed out. No, no, said Belfast, turning his back on the bunk. I will put a head on him if he comes near you. I will smash his mug, exclaimed faintly Wait, enraged and weak. I don't want to kill a man, but... He panted fast like a dog after a run in sunshine. Someone just outside the door shouted, 
He's as fit as any of us. Belfast put his hand on the door handle. Here, called James Waite hurriedly, and in such a clear voice that the others spun round with a start. James Waite, stretched out black and deathlike in the dazzling light, turned his head on the pillow. His eyes stared at Belfast, appealing and impudent. I am rather weak from lying up so long, he said distinctly. Belfast nodded. Getting quite well now, insisted Waite. Yes, I noticed you getting better this last month, said Belfast, looking down. Hello, what's this? he shouted and ran out. He was flattened directly against the side of the house by two men who lurched against him. A lot of disputes seemed to be going on all round. He got clear and saw three indistinct figures standing alone in the fainter darkness under the arched foot of the mainsail that rose above their heads like a convex wall of a high edifice. Duncan hissed, Go for them! It's dark! The crowd took a short run aft in a body. Then there was a check. Duncan, agile and thin, flitted past with his right arm going like a windmill, and then stood still suddenly with his arm pointing rigidly above his head. The hurtling flight of some heavy object was heard. It passed between the heads of the two mates, bounded heavily along the deck, struck the after hatch with a ponderous and deadened blow. The bulky shape of Mr. Baker grew distinct. Come to your senses, men, he cried, advancing at the arrested crowd. Come back, Mr. Baker, called the master's quiet voice. He obeyed unwillingly. There was a minute of silence, then a deafening hubbub arose. Above it, Archie was heard energetically. If you do it again, I will tell. There were shouts. Don't! Drop it! We ain't that kind! The black cluster of human forms reeled against the bulwark, back again towards the house. Ring bolts rang under stumbling feet. Drop it! Let me! No! Curse you! Ha! Then sounds as of someone's face being slapped. A piece of iron fell on the deck. A short scuffle, and someone's shadowy body scuttled rapidly across the main hatch before the shadow of a kick. A raging voice sobbed out a torrent of filthy language. Throwing things. Good God, grunted Mr. Baker in dismay. That was meant for me, said the master quietly. I felt the wind of that thing. What was it, an iron belaying pin? By Jove, muttered Mr. Creighton. The confused voices of men talking amidships mingled with the wash of the sea, ascended between the silent and distended sails seemed to flow away into the night, further than the horizon, higher than the sky. The stars burned steadily over the inclined mastheads. Trails of light lay on the water, broke before the advancing hull, and after she had passed, trembled for a long time as if in awe of the murmuring sea. Meantime the helmsman, anxious to know what the row was about, had let go the wheel and bent double, ran with long, stealthy footsteps to the break of the poop. The Narcissus, left to herself, came up gently to the wind without anyone being aware of it. She gave a slight roll, and the sleeping sails woke suddenly, coming all together with a mighty flap against the mast then filled again one after another in a quick succession of loud reports that ran down the lofty spars, till the collapsed mainsail flew out last with a violent jerk. The ship trembled from trucks to keel. The sails kept on rattling like a discharge of musketry. The chain sheets and loose shackles jingled aloft in a thin peel. The gin blocks groaned. It was as if an invisible hand had given the ship an angry shake to recall the men that peopled her decks to the sense of reality, vigilance, and duty. Helm up! cried the master sharply. Run aft, Mr. Creighton, and see what that fool there is up to. Flatten in the head sheets. Stand by the weather forebraces, growled Mr. Baker. Startled men ran swiftly, repeating the orders. The watch below, abandoned all at once by the watch on deck, drifted towards the forecastle in twos and threes, arguing noisily as they went. "'We shall see tomorrow,' cried a loud voice, as if to cover with a menacing hint an inglorious retreat. And then only orders were heard, the falling of heavy coils of rope, the rattling of blocks. 
Singleton's white head flitted here and there in the night, high above the deck like the ghost of a bird. Going off, sir, shouted Mr. Creighton from aft. Full again. All right. Ease off the head sheets. That will do the braces. Coil the ropes up, grunted Mr. Baker, bustling about. Gradually the tramping noises, the confused sound of voices, died out, and the officers coming together on the poop discussed the events. Mr. Baker was bewildered and grunted. Mr. Creighton was calmly furious, but Captain Allistoon was composed and thoughtful. He listened to Mr. Baker's growling argumentation, to Creighton's interjected and severe remarks, while looking down on the deck he weighed in his hand the iron belaying pin that a moment ago had just missed his head, as if it had been the only tangible fact of the whole transaction. He was one of those commanders who speak little, seem to hear nothing, look at no one, and know everything, hear every whisper, see every fleeting shadow of their ship's life. His two big officers towered above his lean, short figure. They talked over his head. They were dismayed, surprised, and angry, while between them the little quiet man seemed to have found his taciturn serenity in the profound depths of a larger experience. Lights were burning in the forecastle. Now and then a loud gust of babbling chatter came from forward, swept over the decks, and became faint, as if the unconscious ship, gliding gently through the great peace of the sea, had left behind and forever the foolish noise of turbulent mankind. But it was renewed again and again. Gesticulating arms, profiles of heads with open mouths appeared for a moment in the illuminated squares of doorways. Black fists darted, withdrew. Yes, it was most damnable to have such an unprovoked row sprung on one, assented the master. A tumult of yells rose in the light, abruptly ceased. He didn't think there would be any further trouble just then. A bell was struck aft, another forward, answered in a deeper tone, and the clamor of ringing metal spread round the ship in a circle of wide vibrations that ebbed away into the immeasurable night of an empty sea. Didn't he know them? Didn't he? In past years? Better men, too. Real men to stand by one in a tight place. Worse than devils, too, sometimes. Downright horned devils. Pa, This? Nothing. A miss as good as a mile. The wheel was being relieved in the usual way. Full and by, said very loud the man going off. Full and by, repeated the other, catching hold of the spokes. This headwind is my trouble, exclaimed the master, stamping his foot in sudden anger. Headwind! All the rest is nothing. He was calm again in a moment. Keep them on the move tonight, gentlemen, just to let them feel we've got hold all the time. Quietly, you know. Mind you keep your hands off them, Creighton. Tomorrow I will talk to them like a Dutch uncle. A crazy crowd of tinkers. Yes, tinkers. I could count the real sailors amongst them on the fingers of one hand. Nothing will do but a row, if you please. He paused. Did you think I had gone wrong there, Mr. Baker? He tapped his forehead, laughed short. When I saw him standing there, three parts dead and so scared, black amongst that gaping lot, no grit to face what's coming to us all, the notion came to me all at once before I could think. Sorry for him, like you would be for a sick brute, if ever creature was in a mortal funk to die. I thought I would let him go out in his own way, kind of impulse. It never came into my head, those fools. Hmm. Stand to it now, of course. He stuck the belaying pin in his pocket, seemed ashamed of himself, then sharply, If you see Podmore at his tricks again, tell him I will have him put under the pump. Had to do it once before. The fellow breaks out like that now and then. Good cook, though. He walked away quickly, came back to the companion. The two mates followed him through the starlight with amazed eyes. He went down three steps, and, changing his tone, spoke with his head near the deck. I shan't turn in tonight in case of anything. 
Just call out if... Did you see the eyes of that sick nigger, Mr. Baker? I fancied he begged me for something. What? Past all help. One lone black beggar amongst the lot of us, and he seemed to look through me into the very hell. Fancy, this wretched Podmore. Well, let him die in peace. I am master here, after all. Let him be. He might have been half a man once. Keep a good lookout. He disappeared down below, leaving his mates facing one another, and more impressed than if they had seen a stone image shed a miraculous tear of compassion over the incertitudes of life and death. In the blue mist spreading from twisted threads that stood upright in the bowls of pipes, the forecastle appeared as vast as a hall. Between the beams a heavy cloud stagnated, and the lamps, surrounded by halos, burned each at the core of a purple glow in two lifeless flames without rays. Wreaths drifted in denser wisps. Men sprawled about on the deck, sat in negligent poses, or bending a knee, drooped with one shoulder against a bulkhead. Lips moved, eyes flashed, waving arms made sudden eddies in the smoke. The murmur of voices seemed to pile itself higher and higher, as if unable to run out quick enough through the narrow doors. The watch below in their shirts and striding on long white legs resembled raving somnambulists, while now and then one of the watch on deck would rush in, looking strangely overdressed, listen a moment, fling a rapid sentence into the noise and run out again. But a few remained near the door, fascinated, and with one ear turned to deck. "'Stick together, boys!' roared Davis. Belfast tried to make himself heard. Knowles grinned in a slow, dazed way, a short fellow with a thick, clipped beard kept on yelling periodically, Who's afeard? Who's afeard? Another one jumped up, excited, with blazing eyes, sent out a string of unattached curses, and sat down quietly. Two men discussed familiarly, striking one another's breast in turn, to clinch arguments. Three others, with their heads in a bunch, spoke all together with a confidential air, and at the top of their voices... It was a stormy chaos of speech where intelligible fragments tossing struck the ear. One could hear, In the last ship, who cares? Try it on any one of us if... Knock under. Not a hand's turn. He says he is all right. I always thought... Never mind. Duncan, crouching all in a heap against the bowsprit, hunched his shoulder blades as high as his ears and hanging a peaked nose resembled a sick vulture with ruffled plumes. Belfast, straddling his legs, had a face red with yelling, and with arms thrown up figured a Maltese cross. The two Scandinavians in a corner had the dumbfounded and distracted aspect of men gazing at a cataclysm, and beyond the light Singleton stood in the smoke, monumental, indistinct with his head touching the beam, like a statue of heroic size in the gloom of a crypt. He stepped forward, impassive and big. The noise subsided like a broken wave, but Belfast cried once more with uplifted arms, The man is dying, I tell ye! Then sat down suddenly on the hatch and took his head between his hands. All looked at Singleton, gazing upwards from the deck, staring out of dark corners or turning their heads with curious glances. They were expectant and appeased, as if that old man who looked at no one had possessed the secret of their uneasy indignations and desires, a sharper vision, a clearer knowledge. And indeed, standing there amongst them, he had the uninterested appearance of one who had seen multitudes of ships, had listened many times to voices such as theirs, had already seen all that could happen on the wide seas. They heard his voice rumble in his broad chest, as though the words had been rolling towards them out of a rugged past. What do you want to do? he asked. No one answered. Only Knowles muttered, Aye, aye. And somebody said low, It's a blooming shame. He waited, 
made a contemptuous gesture. I have seen rows aboard ship before some of you were born, he said slowly, for something or nothing, but never for such a thing. The man is dying, I tell ye, repeated Belfast, woefully sitting at Singleton's feet. And a black fellow, too, went on the old seaman. I have seen them die like flies. He stopped, thoughtful, as if trying to recollect gruesome things, details of horrors, hecatombs of niggers. They looked at him fascinated. He was old enough to remember slavers, bloody mutinies, pirates, perhaps. Who could tell through what violences and terrors he had lived? What would he say? He said, You can't help him. Die he must. He made another pause. His mustache and beard stirred. He chewed words, mumbled behind tangled white hairs, incomprehensible and exciting, like an oracle behind a veil. Stop ashore. Sick. Instead, bringing all this headwind. Afraid. The sea will have her own. Die in sight of land. Always so. They know it. Long passage. More days. More dollars. You keep quiet. What do you want? Can't help him. 